Hi, yes, over here. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Ela Williams. Um, I recently co covered a um, report by Cathy Adams on public concern at work. I think she basically talked about encouraging employees to have an open whistleblowing policy, where in reality I think it doesn't actually work. From what I understood that part of the problem was the fact that a lot of it is based on ignorance um, and that there isn't actually a mandatory um, to, to, to actually report. So there isn't a mandatory, they're, they're encouraged to report. <coughs> but there is no stipulation that mandatory sort of reporting has to be um, carried out. Um, I'm currently dealing with something within the uh, healthcare system, and the same principle seems to be happening, is that, for example, doctors are not, allow not obliged to actually report any sort of um, misdemeanor or d issues around drug safety. So I'm just wondering about the issue about mandatory um, reporting. Um. Yeah. I win. It touches a little bit on what you were saying as well. Um, without accountability, nothing will change. So, firstly, the whistleblower needs to be protected, but the, there has to be accountability of the people responsible for the wrongdoing, and that's what Edna's law would do, would make it a criminal offence. Um, a lot of... There's a lot of discussion about putting the onus on the whistleblower. Mm. I think the whistleblower has enough courage and enough responsibility already put on them. I think it's the employer and their response to the whistleblower's concerns where the emphasis should be. And if, you know, if murder wasn't illegal and there was just a policy and procedure on it, I don't think it'd be very effective at reducing the number of murders. So I think you need to have a criminal sanction on the employer for that to change. And you know, policies and procedures are all very well about, you know, if you're having a fire drill, but they're not when people's lives are on the line and depend on the whistleblower being able to speak out. I think there's... there's a, <clears throat> I think there's, there's, there, there is another problem, too, that I think that when organisations, for example, like Public Concern at Work in Britain, um, are partly responsible for the very law which now whistleblowers are having to fight against, uh, you have an additional in integral problem that's not dealt with in any other way. And I think the, which is why that several new organizations have also been formed here. Uh, one of them, the Whistler, which is uh, entirely devoted, as, as uh, 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 Eileen has mentioned, to protecting the, the whistleblower themselves uh, rather than institutional forms and, and procedures, which may look good on paper, but which don't actually address apparently any of the really substantive concerns of whistleblowers. And internationally, uh, there's another formation too called Courage, which is attempting to provide sustenance and support for uh, sources and source protection, and because we don't have anything like that now at all. And I think the journalist community up to now has expressed no interest, sadly, until now, in actually helping whistleblowers, who are their primary source of controversial information, uh, of often extremely difficult and personally harrowing disclosure, uh, to get the support and protection they need, which is one of the reasons why we're dealing with this question here as, as, as so centrally, because it is critical that we have to support the very people who provide so much of what we do and what the journalist community demands from its people. Yeah, go ahead, down there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, yep. um, my name is Noel Finn. I'm a whistleblower from the Arleswood um, Detention Centre. Um, I raised concerns in 2012, and I'm still not getting any response from the government in regards to the human rights issues in Yarlswood. Uh, I'm still getting a brick wall uh, on that. So just to let you know that the PETA law is not working, and employment are not supporting whistleblowers. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, down here, if we may. Sorry, we just, just which way from Michael? We'll just get one to you right away. Right, there we are. right down here. Thanks. <laughs> That's yeah. All right. Uh, Go ahead. B, you mentioned um, uh, that one of the things we need to do is to make it easier for whistleblowers to come forward. And what concrete suggestions, ideas do you have for that? And particularly where journalists may be involved. Yeah, is ahead. this you can speak. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I think one of the the 
the principles we operate with at GAP is the best whistleblower is the one you never knew about. So the kinds of protections that are most effective are, the, are protections of identity, that there's a safe channel for reporting where we can be sure that the whistleblower's identity is protected. We need, this isn't to say that, that disclosures should be anonymous, because if you have anonymous disclosures, you can't follow up with the whistleblower. You can't ask questions. You can't validate. You can't put a framework around what's being disclosed. What you need is a confidential channel so that there is a, 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 a two-way communication between the, the investigator and, and the whistleblower. And, and that's really the best and, and the safest mechanism. And, and we try to ensure that in, in the best of circumstances, the identity of the person is, is never uh, exposed. At GAP, we, we've become somewhat expert in laundering information. What, what often exposes a whistleblower is that he or she is talking about something very few people know about. So you take the disclosure out of the institution, disseminate it to more people, and then act on it, for example. But there, there, are, there are ways in which to protect uh, the whistleblower's identity, and that's the primary, the primary way to protect a person. Yeah. Eileen talked about how once you go internally and then you go externally, um, management is going to know who you are. I have a simple question for um, reporting things on a different scale, much minor, but one category that is not protected is people who are not in employment and who do whistleblowing. For example, in my case, I was a mature student in the university, Staffordshire. I reported that after a year, the replies that I get is, we are not obliged to investigate any reporting that you do, even if you as a student you're a member of the faculty, because PETA doesn't apply to you because you're not employed. Now, if you check many universities in the UK, most of them take the spirit of the law and take the reporting of any member of the faculty, and they follow that with the authorities. I have a cover-up operations by the Vice Chancellor of the University of Staffordshire. They decided not to investigate any of the crimes and any of the wrongdoings that I reported. I lost my career, and I lost substantially, substantially to the point of ending up in St. Thomas and having a heart operation. So I almost died for that. Nobody is protecting people who are not employed, but who have substantial stakes at all, mm -hmm. and who takes the courage to go and report on things. I lost two years of my life. I also, lo I almost lost my life, and nobody's investigating it. Done nothing. So how can we get? How can we extend the protection mm -hmm. of PIDA and other laws to people who are not in employment? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me with this? Yeah. yeah. Um, that's the biggest failure of PEDA is the lack of accountability. We, I take a lot of calls from people um, from your background, from universities in the same position. So, you know, I, I am aware that there's a major problem there. I think the common theme in where the law is failing is the lack of accountability and the fact that the disclosures are never put right. <laughs> Every whistleblower that comes through to me are more concerned about the wrongdoing Correct. than what's happening to them. And that's the genuine whistleblower. That they're not saying, oh, what are my rights as, you know, but how can I get this wrong put right, even if it's two years afterwards? Yeah. They're still fighting against the wrongdoing. And that is the, the, the heart of what I believe is wrong, is to get the accountability. And the way you get the accountability is to make it a criminal offence for the employer to fail to act on genuine concerns. Yeah, even for, for all whistleblowers equally. I believe that all whistleblowers equally need to be protected and they need to be protected by the state. If someone is acting in the public interest, then surely it's, it's in the state's interest to treat that person as a protected witness instead of as a whistleblower. I honestly, you know, seen 
whistleblowers every day stitched up, but always they're still trying to put right the wrong. And as with the Panorama whistleblower, they came out, they could have walked away, got on with their lives, public concern at work, tell whistleblowers every day, forget about the wrongdoing, you've done your bit, walk away and leave it. That's the bit that whistleblowers cannot do because they cared enough to speak out. They want the wrong put right. So, yes, I absolutely understand where you're coming from. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Ben. I'm from an organisa a campaigning organisation called Payday. We've been supporting uh, many whistleblowers, Chelsea Manning, Assange and others. There's a, a case at the moment in the US of prisoners who have been whistleblowers. So, really, whistleblowers are in every institution, as the speaker rightly said. On the one hand, it's fantastic there is this network of people ready you know, to stand up and care for others. On the other hand, I feel it's very frightening to see that all institutions, by definition, are rotten. <laughs> if we need all, no, but it's true, there's no local authority. It seems to me, uh, social services, hospital, even parliament, that are not uh, you know, rotten in the sense that we need all these whistleblowers to uh, tell us the truth. I, I wanted to say, uh, I think it's very important, as you mentioned, that the, the, the press get involved, and I think both of you mentioned the importance of that. I also think that in addition, it is very important to build a movement to support whistleblowers, because the press may uh, show interest from time to time, but I think it's important that you maintain you know, the support uh, throughout. And I was wondering, Eileen, if you could say more about an uh, example of how you've been working maybe with families and other supporters. Yeah. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to make it clear that the old deanery care home that the Panorama was about was not an exception. You had 11 people go forward with detailed evidence to the CQC, to the local safeguarding, phoned up, gave details, got the impression that safeguarding were bored with them. Um, nothing changed, and then Panorama went in and filmed people that were defenceless being slapped. So that's going back to the accountability thing. But um, as in supporting all whistleblowers, you know, even though I come from healthcare, I can relate to any whistleblower from any area because we all <coughs> have common links. And I think it's people power that change things. I mean, I'm not it, compassion and care and the whistler. We don't sit behind a desk and go, "Oh, isn't it shocking what's going on?" Yes. We bear witness. Yes. We we publish our evidence. We take to the streets. We've been in Parliament recently, giving them a headache with like hundreds of whistles being blown. And we're going <laughs> to continue. We're going to continue. I I send daily um, <clears throat> tweets to Sir Robert Francis and challenge him who's currently carrying out a review into whistleblowing, and ask him to have the courage of a whistleblower. I ask the government to have the courage of a whistleblower and just do what's right and protect people properly with a law that would be an example to the rest of the world. At the minute, public concern at work and PEDA are a sorry excuse, and our next protest will be burning PEDA. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Gavin, Gavin, yeah. Gavin, yeah. Could, I, could I say something? Yeah. I, I just want to um, say a little something uh, about how, how protection works in general. It's, it's a process, and a number of, of different forces have to come to bear. At GAP, for example, we too drafted the Whistleblower Protection Act of 1989, and we drafted the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act in the United States of 2012, we saw then in the courts the laws undermined. After WPA was, was passed in 1989, there were court decisions that where the rule, one ruling, the most devastating one, was that if you were a lawyer if you m made a disclosure of information you discovered in the course of doing your normal job duties, you are not a whistleblower and you're not entitled to protection. Which meant that if you're an auditor, if you're an investigator, if you're a lawyer, if you're a compliance professional, an <coughs> inspector general, these are all the people, of course, who are going to see corruption and fraud. You're not a whistleblower, you're not entitled to protection. So we had to go back to the legislature 
and try to reform the law. And we play a kind of inside-outside game. That is, we have lawyers on our staff who talk to the White House, who talk to legislators. But we also have people who will put a movement in the streets. So what we do is we say to the ethics advisor at the White House, you can deal with us or you can deal with them. But the fact that we talk to the government doesn't compromise us. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have a conflict of interest. And, and because the law isn't perfect, doesn't mean it's no good at all. It means that we work toward the implementation of it, the strengthening of it, and the, and the, and the, and the effectiveness of it. Because if there's no law at all, then we have nowhere even to begin. Yeah, right, done, done, done. yeah. Uh, Christine England, I'm a um, health and social care whistleblower, a uh, bit of a serial whistleblower for myself and campaigning for everything from doctors to social care workers. So I've been involved in a number of cases and unfortunately I found public concern at work are very much on the employer's side. They have encouraged me and other people I've been campaigning with and for to basically take the money and, quote, get a life. Don't worry about this, move on. And that's my first comment. The other comment is that the, the cases where I've been involved in, it has only been journalists that have stopped the wrongdoing, which can be financial fraud, abuse, and negligence in places like Hammersmith Hospital. Every time when I negotiated with the Department of Health, through three formal inquiries. It was each time when I threatened to expose Lord Robert Winston that suddenly we had um, a movement forward in our negotiations. Now, public concern at work, they just dropped the case. All they're interested in is looking after their customers, the employers. I accept that they have done some support for some whistleblowers, but the emphasis of their work is on looking after their paying customers. That's my own opinion. Um, the other thing is I'm now an avid supporter of Edna's Law because it would bring people like Lord Robert Winston who knew for a long time of um, various wrongdoing which was harming patients at Hammersmith Hospital. Um, he is, people like him are part of the problem because he is so um, embedded in the BBC that the BBC will protect him as well. And question? I think Edna's law is the only way forward to bring people to account and to actually get the wrongdoing rectified. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm sorry, we probably... Very, very, very briefly. Very briefly. I'm also from Payday Man's Network, and uh, I can tell that we will put on our website www.refusingtokill.net and a petition so that people can sign through us as well. I mean, we need support on these things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. very much. I want to thank our two speakers very much for that. <laughs>